Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. In this episode, we're going to take a look at a homemade triggered spark gap. If you're looking for a high voltage electronic switch that's capable of driving Marx generators and nitrogen lasers, then this is the episode for you. So let's go. In previous videos that I'll link in down below, um, I designed and built several nitrogen lasers. Uh, this is a very, very small version of them. Um, and sim what we do in simple terms is we charge up a very high value capacitor to about 17 odd thousand volts. And that is switched automatically by a spark gap into a peaking capacitor and then across the laser channel. The spark gap itself is, is basically a high voltage switch with a, a known breakdown voltage. So in this case, you know, about 17 odd thousand volts. Um, and I suppose, you know, in the, in the previous videos as well, if we wanted to get this to run faster, we just turn up the voltage or turn up the currents as it were charging up the capacitor um, a lot quicker um, and therefore discharging it into the channel a lot quicker. And, you know, we were getting reasonable repetition rates out of this. Um, but we've no way of really controlling it. So if I want it to fire once, um, that's kind of a difficult job, right? I can sort of slowly turn up the voltage until the spark gap finally trips, but that's not really control. Uh, in other videos as well, we looked at MNL100 nitrogen lasers and these hard solid state switches in. I've got some examples of um, semiconductor switches that we could use. I've got a couple of MOSFETs here and I've got a, um, a, a rather high value thyristor here or SCR if you prefer. This is rated for one and a half thousand volts, but it costs 40 bucks. And so if I wanted to have, um, you know, if I wanted to be able to switch even just 15,000 volts, I'd have to have at least 10 of these in a stack, right? And then I'd pay 400 bucks. Even with, you know, insulated gate bipolar transistors or MOSFETs or whatever, I mean, I, yeah, sure, I could stack up like 12 um, or 14 of these in series um, to get the voltage that I want. And then I've got the additional problems with designing uh, gate drive transformers that can withstand the voltage from one end of the stack to the other. And it become very expensive and I'm on a very, very limited budget in terms of both money and time. Um, so obviously we want a simpler solution to this. If we go back to the original spark gaps real quick, uh, this is one of the original spark gaps I was using on the nitrogen laser, and we unscrew the ends, we can see that very, very simply, it's just two electrodes uh, separated by a gap. And so what we could do is apply a trigger voltage. We could have a pin in there uh, that we can apply a high voltage to that will fire the gap when we want it to fire. Um, spark gaps have been in use for many, many years in uh, all sorts of lasers. They've, they've been used in eczema lasers and they've been used in nitrogen lasers, uh, used in Marx generators, they're used in Tesla coils, right? Spark gaps are everywhere. They are the Chuck Norris of high voltage switches, it has to be said. I mean, they're really, really robust. Uh, the spark gap breaks when it's either caught fire, exploded or vaporized, right? Uh, but anything else, it doesn't really matter. You know, if we accidentally overvolt it or accidentally apply too much voltage to the trigger pin, it makes no difference whatsoever. Semiconductor switches on the other hand, you know, I mean we could, like I say, stack up a dozen of these um, and put them all in series and hope to God that it works, but you know, if we destroy one, we we'll probably destroy the, you know, we'll probably take out the entire stack as well and that starts to become expensive. Um, the difference is, I mean, with semiconductor switches, obviously we've got extreme precision. Um, so if, you know, like down to the nanosecond, I suppose, if I apply a, a, a trigger voltage to my gates on these, uh, these MOSFETs, we can guarantee that it will fire in almost instantaneously, right? We'd have to look it up on the data sheet, but it'll be with, within a couple of nanoseconds. Uh, spark gaps, on the other hand, suffer from jitter. Um, so even if we trigger a spark gap, we can expect a small delay between the um, trigger voltage and the actual firing of the gap. So yeah, as I said, these are robust, really, really robust. Uh, here's a close-up of a spark gap firing in my homemade March generator. Each spark gap is, uh, is commutating or switching 30 odd thousand volts at hundreds, possibly thousands of amps. And the final output voltage, as we can see there, is about 120 odd thousand volts, which is, you know, pretty impressive. So as I said, static gaps like this are free running, which means essentially once the breakdown voltage is reached, it will just flash over internally and that, you know, fires the gap. And um, they're actually quite slow as well, because you can imagine if we apply a high voltage to this gap, we're going to get corona in the first instance. And then once enough ions are present in the channel, then suddenly it'll break down. So I want to look at how we might trigger something like this. So I've got a very simple diagram here, a very, very simplified diagram of a spark gap. We've got two electrodes, we've got an anode here, and a cathode um, connected across a capacitor and we're applying a high voltage to it. And we can actually gap uh, the spark gap in such a way that it won't fire when we apply like 20,000 volts, um, for example. So we can apply 20 kilovolts to this gap and we can pressurize it and make sure that it doesn't fire. Uh, what we have here is a third pin. Uh, so this is a trigger electrode and the idea is 
that if we apply a high voltage to the trigger electrode, we've got a very, very small gap between it and the cathode. And so that will generate a tiny spark. And it only has to be a very, very small spark as well, but the small spark will generate enough ions that suddenly we'll get an avalanche discharge in the channel and the gap will fire. If you've watched my previous video on how these spark gaps are made, they're all made out of plumbing fittings, you know, they're just off the shelf stuff. But there becomes a point where you can't just buy off the shelf stuff to do what you need to do. So I went and invested in a mini lathe um, in order to make my own parts for the trigger side of these gaps. So here's a cathode assembly for my spark gap. We can see that we've got a, a brass finial in here. That I've centre drilled a hole in, I've silver soldered this in. Um, to a brass cup, which is threaded on the inside, three quarter BSP. Um, we're also threaded on this side as well to accept a spark plug. So I figured, you know, if, if, for, for the trigger electrode, why, why mess around with epoxy and stuff when I can buy an off the shelf component that will do the job. So I have a spark plug here and all that we really have to do is trim off the original spark gap, uh, which I also did in the lathe. So now we've got a sort of trim down spark plug with the center pin projecting some distance from the end there got a little small o-ring and we can just assemble the cathode side of the gap absolutely fantastic so we've got an o-ring in there because once again we're going to be pressurizing this right but we should be able to see the center pin in the middle of the cathode there excellent um, the only thing that's left to do with this is to build a, an instrument that can drive the spark gap, right? So we need, we need an instrument that can generate a spark uh, from a signal, you know, so a TTL signal or optical signal or whatever. So let's go and take a look at that as well. So here's the trigger generator I've built for triggered spark gaps and it will also double up as a nice little trigger generator for uh, xenon flash tubes when I get to building some solid state lasers. Um, but yeah, let's have a quick look at the front panel here. Uh, I've got DC input for 12 volts and a little power switch to turn it on and off. Um, I've got two inputs here. Uh, on the right is a fiber optic connection so that I can uh, hook up my function generator without frying the function generator in case anything kicks back into it. Um, I've got a BNC sort of TTL connector if I really, really want to do something with, you know, simple 555 or maybe even a microcontroller. I've also got a, a little single shot test button on the top there so that we can fire off the uh, trigger transformer once as well. And then we've got our high voltage output on the left hand side. Let's pop the lid on this and take a look and see what it looks like internally. So here's the guts of this thing. I've got a little 500 volt power supply that I got off eBay. Um, for, I think these are like four or five pounds. It's a no brainer. I mean, why bother building something like that when you can just buy it off the shelf? Um, I've got a rather large trigger transformer that I also picked up off eBay. If anybody's interested, it's a YD350 uh, by UIDAR Electric made in Taiwan. Um, quite a substantially sized trigger transformer, it has to be said. So on the right hand side here, we've got uh, our fiber optic input. Um, so these were taken out of a MNL100 nitrogen laser that I'd scrapped the controller from. Um, I think it's the 2524Z um, fiber optic input. Uh, I've got a little 5 volt regulator on here and that's pretty much that. Uh, the circuit board here is for the single shot. So the idea behind this is I've got a, cu a couple of Schmidt triggers and um, some um, um, RC differentiators to debounce the switch initially and then to give me a pulse that's exactly 100 microseconds wide um, that then fires off the thyristor. Uh, for the trigger transformer. Uh, the reason behind this is if we have a pulse that's much larger than 100 microseconds, I mean say like a 200 microsecond pulse, it will cause the SCR to latch up and then it shorts out the power supply and bad things kind of happen. Um, so yeah, we've got our main discharge capacitor here that discharges through the uh, thyristor into the uh, trigger transformer and then we've got a nice little insulated high voltage feed through on the front there. Let's power this up real quick and we can see the spark out of the thing because Everybody likes sparks, so we'll just plug it in and switch it on so we're all live. And we'll see if we can catch a spark on the video there. So it's a quite a, quite a feeble little spark on the output, but it's certainly, certainly enough to trigger my spark gap. So I've got my fiber optic cable here and it's pulsing at about 18 hertz. We will just turn the power off before I plug this thing in. So there's my fiber optic connected. And now I've got my 18 hertz signal and we can obviously turn it up and down with the function generator 
um, to whatever repetition we see fit. Excellent. Um, for actually driving the fiber optic, all I have on the function generator is a BNC connector that I've modified um, that basically has an LED soldered across it and the fiber optic cable just pushes in there and looks into the end of the LED. So nothing complicated at that end at all. I know that some of you will be interested in the circuit diagram for this, so let's have a look. So this is a simplified internal schematic of my uh, trigger generator. We've got an R2524Z fiber optic receiver, which receives our 100 microsecond wide light pulse in. The output from this is inverted, so we need to invert it again to give us a positive going edge, and this is done with a simple uh, 2N3904. Um, excellent. The trigger from, from that is fed into a Mach 3020 opto triac, um, which then triggers our SCR dumping 0.2 microfarads at 500 odd volts uh, into our trigger transformer and that gives us our 15 odd thousand volts out as our trigger pulse. Uh, for the single shot circuit, um, I've simply got a switch debouncing um, arrangement with a couple of resistors, a capacitor um, and a Schmidt trigger. Um, this is also fed into an IC differentiator because as I said before, if we have a pulse that's longer than 100 microseconds or so, it will cause our SCR to latch up. Um, so the IC differentiator and the Schmidt trigger sort of combined give us a 100 microsecond pulse out, um, guaranteed. So no matter how hard or how long I hold in the switch for, I will always get a 100 microsecond pulse out and it's bang on 100 microseconds as well. And that's also fed um, into our Mach 3020 so that we can manually fire it. I have the cathode side of the trigger spark gap hooked up to the trigger generator here and I'm feeding it an 8 hertz signal. We might be able to see it in there. See if we can shield it from the light. We might be able to see the tiny little spark um, firing from our trigger pin to the cathode there. And that's literally enough to trigger the main gap. Excellent. So on the subject of spark gaps, I'll just show you the upgraded uh, version of this triggered gap. Uh, so we'll just set that off to one side. Here it is. Um, it's quite neat, I think, in the end. Um, yeah, there's a couple of small changes because I have a lathe now. I've turned down this three quarter inch BSP fitting so it's nice and uh, nice and rounded and I don't have to worry about uh, Corona spraying off the top and causing flashover. And I've got a nice barbed connector there for our nitrogen feed. And if we just undo the anode end, um, there's our hole f through which the nitrogen comes and the anode is just simply a brass dome nut. Uh, mounted on a stock, so that's that. Uh, the body is as before, a three quarter inch BSP fitting um, with plexiglass discs and the cathode end obviously has now been modified. What I've done here is turn down half of the uh, three quarter inch BSP fitting and press fit it into an aluminium block. Um, I can bolt this to the side of the laser and get a really, really low impedance path to ground, uh, which will be absolutely fantastic. Don't have to worry about scorch marks and things anymore if we're gonna do something like that. Um, on the inside, we've got our cathode with the hole in the middle there, and then we have our CM6 spark plug, which is going to act as our trigger electrode. Um, this also has a, a, a little, um, little seal in there as well, so everything's nice and gas tight. Um, it should be noted as well, I did look up commercial spark gaps online. You can buy them, you can buy commercial triggered spark gaps, and they actually run into thousands of dollars as well. Uh, this has cost almost nothing in parts. You know, you're talking, I don't know, what, 10, 15 bucks in fittings, um, and then some time spent on the lathe, and we have something that I would say is not far off being almost as good as a commercial unit. So yeah, excellent. So I have the new triggered spark gap mounted on the nitrogen laser. I've had to reconfigure the charge transfer circuit because one side of the spark gap needs to be ground referenced in order to apply a trigger pulse and actually get it to work. I've got 10 PSI of nitrogen running into the gap just now. Um, so it's, it's at pressure and we're currently standing off about 20,000 volts across the gap. And of course the nitrogen laser isn't firing. If I press the trigger button here real quick, we can get the thing to fire. Absolutely fantastic. So now we have a nitrogen laser that really is under some kind of control. Instead of the thing being free running, we can deliberately and willfully apply a pulse to it and get the thing to fire when we want it to fire. Um, as I showed earlier, there's a couple of other inputs on here. We've got a BNC and a fiber optic input. I'll connect up the fiber optic real quick to a function generator and then we'll just be able to have it run off of the function generator.
So I have the function generator set up and putting me out a, a 10 hertz signal down the fiber optic. And if we turn the trigger unit on real quick, we'll be able to see this thing run at 10 hertz. Absolutely fantastic. So now this thing's mostly under control, right? Um, it could do with being put in a shielded box um, and you know, perhaps we could run it off of a microcontroller or something like that. Uh, the power supply as well, I'll just turn it off while I'm waving my hands around. Um, the power supply itself also needs upgrading. So this thing's only capable of putting out like five milliamps. And so 10 Hertz is about the maximum we can get out of uh, this size of nitrogen laser with this size of dumping capacitor on it. Um, so if we were to increase the current to maybe 20, 30 milliamps or so, then we'd be able to get, you know, pretty reasonable repetition rates out of this thing. Um, the little triggered gap is capable of easily running up to 100 hertz, um, you know, so 100 pulses per second, which would be really, really incredible to see on this kind of laser. So I suppose a future project will be to upgrade this power supply here um, and actually do that. But yeah, absolutely fantastic. It seems to have worked out really, really well indeed. So as an additional aside, because we've got a situation now where we can purposefully trigger the gap whenever we like, uh, we can actually perform a series of experiments to actually optimize this nitrogen laser design. I mean, you know, sort of prior to this, uh, yeah, I've done a bit of optimization, but really not so much in terms of, well, how many volts should we really have discharging across the channel, which, you know, how many volts is optimal. Uh, and so currently we're, we're sitting at about uh, 19 and a half thousand volts. And if I trigger the nitrogen laser, it works very, very well. There's not a single spark in the channel. Um, if we wanted to, we could measure the output over here. Um, but yeah, we could turn up the pressure on the gap, for example. Um, I'll turn it up to 15 PSI, which means it'll stand off a higher voltage. And we'll crank it up until it just starts firing and then back it off. So that would be about there. So now we're sitting at 22,000 volts and we can fire it at that and see you know, we could make a measurement and see if, if we're actually getting any more output. I suspect we aren't. I suspect there's an upper limit with these things. And certainly if you read the literature, it would appear that there is. But yeah, we could optimize the channel width. We could optimize the channel voltage. Uh, you know, we could really crank this up. So I could put like, um, what about 18 PSI into the gap and see if we can get to about 25,000 volts. About there. I don't know if this will pick up on the camera very well, but now there are large sparks in the channel because we're driving this thing far too hard. The output still looks, you know, really quite bright. But once again, I suppose the thing to do would be to stick all this stuff in a shielded box um, and then actually measure our output in a sensible fashion. Um, but yeah, you know, actually being able to control um, high voltage in this way uh, really opens up sort of new avenues in terms of experimentation and actually you know doing things properly instead of just taking guesses at what the gap of the spark gap should be and you know what the what the voltage should be and so on um, so yeah a really really fantastic addition to this nitrogen laser it has to be said all in all, this triggered gap has worked out very well. It's, it's worked well in the nitrogen laser, and I'm fairly convinced it could be pressed into service um, in other things as well. So for example, we could run it in a Marx generator as the first gap. Um, in a Marx generator, we'd only need to trigger the bottom gap, and then all the other gaps would uh, fire off automatically because they've been overvolted. Um, I suppose if you were really interested in this kind of thing, you could, uh, I'd be interested to see if somebody would be uh, interested in putting this in a Tesla coil and having like a single shot Tesla coil. Um, that would be kind of cool as well. Um, and obviously, like I say, for the purpose I wanted was lasers. So yeah, it's worked out really quite fantastically well. Thanks for watching this episode of Les's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below, and I'll see you guys next time.